Good morning, everybody, um, to our today's session from Dynamo Express. Um, today's talk is about uh, material uh, model parameterization in ANSA. And this talk was given by uh, Dirk Dreisig um, from Lasso Engineering. Uh, Dirk actually studied uh, aerospace engineering at the University of Stuttgart. And now he's, um, support, he's part of the support team at Lasso Engineering and is responsible for ANSA in Meta and optimization and automatization. Yeah, and today he will give a talk about model parallelization in ANSA. This, by the way, that's the first part, and next week there will be a second part um, regarding a similar topic. Okay, so um, with that being said, um, <laughs> the stage is yours. Take your microphone. Yes, hello everybody from my side as well. I hope uh, you can hear me quite well. Um, yes, we can hear you. At least you can hear me. I can okay. hear you, so I think everyone else as well. Um, for those who did not yet uh, mute their microphones, please mute your microphones. Otherwise, there will be a lot of noise. So, um, yeah, today we will... Uh, have a short look on uh, the features of ANSA concerning parameterization of our models. We will see uh, the possibilities that uh, ANSA offers, um, especially in order to parameterize our models for an optimization procedure which, on which we will have a look next week. So, um, there are different types of parameterization. The first one um, is uh, the, the shape optimization or the shape modification. When we want to uh, change sizes of uh, parts of our model, for example, here, uh, the location, size of the B pillar, this is typically done uh, with morphing functionalities in ANSA. We'll have a closer look on that in a few minutes. Um, another type of parameters uh, are the so-called ANSA parameters, um, especially if you want to uh, modify card values, for example, uh, property thickness values, and different material values or the material itself that is used, but also connection properties. Uh, here, the distance of spot welds along a spot weld line. All these things can be uh, parameterized by using ANSA parameters. And uh, for everything else, like uh, when you want to do some mesh studies or if you want to do optimization with uh, kinetics, um, we can use scripting. All right, let's come uh, to the morphing. Morphing actually can be applied as well or on, on FE models, so pure meshes, no matter what type of elements are used, and also geometry, which means uh, the cut faces. We have two main methods in ANSA. The first one is uh, the box morphing. Box morphing means we put our model in so-called morphing boxes. Depending on what we want to do, uh, we fit uh, and adjust the boxes onto the geometry like it's done here on this example. And then we uh, move the boxes and everything which is inside the boxes is moved accordingly. The other possibility is uh, the so-called direct morphing. Um, with direct morphing, no boxes need to be created. We can directly uh, touch our geometry, our meshes. 
say how specific areas should be moved and uh, define areas like here. This will be one that is uh, morphed. Okay, let's have a, a look on the, on the different types of uh, box morphing. At first, we uh, see the different types of boxes that are available. Um, we have different types of 3D boxes, hexahedral, pentahedral, tetrahedral, like uh, typical solid FE elements as well, but also some cylindrical boxes for modifying pipes, for example. But there are also 2D boxes for uh, sheet parts where we do not want to uh, change um, dimensions in thickness direction, but only in the, in the area. Um, these 2D boxes, they have a specific thickness um, like shell elements and everything which is contained within this, let's say, virtual 3D box. This uh, is affected by the morphing later on. And one dimension less 1D boxes, they have a specific diameter and everything which is contained inside this uh, Pipe, let's say morphing pipe um, will be affected by the morphing. So if you do not want to change uh, the size, the diameter, only the shape of the line, then you can go for 1D boxes. So let's see how we can uh, create boxes. Actually, th this depends a little bit on uh, on the model and on what you actually want to do with the boxes later on. Um, typically, you uh, when you create, for example, tri 3D boxes, um, you create them around the area that you want to uh, modify. So you can just select the area and say you want to create a box around it, either in a according to a specific coordinate system or simply adapted to the shape of the, of the area. So we can create um, offset boxes around them. These are typically used in order to uh, connect to neighboring areas in order not to um, detach the, the area that is, that is affected by the morphing from the rest of the model. So kind of buffer boxes. We can split boxes and uh, attach edges, but also surfaces onto the geometry like it's done here. The front line of the roof is attached to a morphing edge. Some additional control points are inserted in order to capture the curvature. We can uh, sweep or collide uh, a cross section through a model according to its shape. And we can use kind of wrap functionalities in order to build boxes that are well, wrapped around our geometry. And some more like uh, selecting explicitly some points or some lines, edges, or connecting boxes by their faces. So, and how can we modify the boxes when they are created? Actually, um, the boxes are modified by moving their control points. These control points, they act like, uh, like nodes of an FE model. So these are the nodes of our uh, box, morph box model. We can move them 
in uh, any direction according to any coordinate system. We can rotate them like well, these normal transformation possibilities that affect for other uh, types of entities in ANSA as well. We can slide or extend them, which means we move the control points along existing, uh, also curved edges of the box. This is meant with slide or extend. Extend is just the extension over uh, into the next box or over an end of the edge. We can change an angle by keeping the control points sliding on their neighboring edges. Fitting to edge surface, I already mentioned. Um, well, actually, here are some uh, target lines not visible. We just see this, the result. Yeah. So this was a kind of edge fitting. For cylindrical boxes, uh, we can uh, modify the radius. You can also uh, well, have some nested cylindrical boxes with some uh, consecutive uh, radii. So more than one radii can be, uh, radius can be changed with uh, a morphing, a cylindrical morphing box. So here the inner radius of a morphing box, this cylindrical morphing box is changed. And also some more functions available. If you have a, well, it's a symmetrical model, like a, a car body, uh, which is left on the left side, symmetrical to the right side, more or less. Um, we can make use of so-called link morphing boxes in order to define everything only once and then uh, link the boxes and also all the affected parameters if we have some um, accordingly. So we can uh, have link morphing boxes uh, with respect to a symmetry plane or a mirror plane um, like here left, right side. We can have link boxes also with, uh, with specific translation transformations. Like here, the green one is the master. The orange ones or the brown ones are the slaves. So, and everything which we do on the master is done to the slaves as well. Here, according to a rotation axis. So, a 2D box, blue one is the master, the other five are the slaves. All right. Especially if you have uh, well several areas that you want to uh, change the shape of, um, there are different uh, let's say strategies to uh, to realize what you want to do. You can create one um, group of boxes that is split in order to uh, capture everything, all the morphing actions that you want to. Do, um, but it is more effective and more robust and safe um, to have a separate group of boxes for each modification that you want to 
implement. And uh, then we are uh, at the so-called box in box morphing. Um, let's see this uh, example here. We uh, have uh, how we call the global morphing, a global modification. Um, and this is the position of the B pillar here. Between left and right side, we have this uh, this green part, which is here. This should be at the same location where the B pillar is, of course. Um, but uh, we also want to change the size of this cross member. So I call it a local modification. So uh, we create boxes for the global. the global modification and separate independent boxes for the local modification. So the local and the global group, they are not connected by any means. Uh, and then we can uh, morph First, the global modification, and afterwards, the local one. And you should take care on this sequence. Always do the modification from the outside to the inside. Otherwise, it may happen that uh, you do it the other way around. When you increase the width of this cross member, nodes and also the um, the control points of the inner boxes, they move outside the boxes of the global modification. And then the global morphing will fail. So always do the morphing from the outer to the inner. So there are a lot of different um, tools in ANSA. And uh, one of uh, the big advantage of ANSA is that all these tools are or can be coupled together. So we can, we have, for example, a kinetics tool. It's a multi-body dynamic solver, which uh, can be used for positioning things um, besides doing uh, kinetic simulation, and uh, we can link this kinetics solver also with morphing. So, for example, we can add morph control points of our boxes in kinetic bodies in order to morph, for example, here this foam by simply moving the bodies with the kinetics tool. So the morphing is controlled by the kinetics. But also the other way round is possible. You can include uh, rigid bodies in morph boxes and you morph and the position of the bodies changes, of course. All right. Um, when you do morphing, you may want to uh, store specific um, shapes of the model uh, in order to retrieve them at a later point. Um, this can be uh, done by using so-called history states, morph history states. Illustrated here, it's such a feature phone. We have different stage, stages here, an initial state, and some others where different morphing actions have been applied. 
but you can not only um, let's say activate or go back to these several saved history states, you can also create interpolations between them in an arbitrary way. So the big advantage of using morphing boxes is that uh, you can reapply them quite easy on uh, multiple and similar models. Just store them with all their parameters um, in a separate ANSA database and uh, merge them in another model, maybe for another discipline or similar sized model and reuse them without having to create them uh, from scratch again. Okay, let's finish the box morphing at this point and uh, have a look on, uh, on the other big topic concerning morphing, um, the so-called direct morphing. Direct morphing has been uh, enhanced and uh, spread a lot in the last years in ANSA. The main advantage of uh, the direct morphing is that you do not have to create boxes at all, but uh, you directly touch the, the model, the elements or the geometry. Um, Meanwhile, you can uh, use also parameters for almost every direct morphing action in order to use them uh, in an optimization. So let's see some examples um, of direct morphing in ANSA. At first here, a direct morphing um, of this uh, mirror case then uh, FE mesh and uh, direct morphing actually is or behaves always the same no matter what type of direct morphing you apply. So for example, if we do a rotation or a translation or a fitting, um, we always have a group of entities so-called control entities on which we apply a specific movement. For example, in this case, uh, a rotation. So these control entities, they are actually not morphed, but they move in a specific way. So we apply a prescribed motion on it, let's say. All right. So uh, besides these control entities, we have uh, the actual morphed entities. In this case, it's the area between the mirror case and the A pillar here. These uh, purple areas. And then we have a boundary to the rest of the model. Blue one, I hope you can see the blue line here. And then we morph it, which means we move the green area Purple area is the purple area is morphed, and the definition is actually much easier than to create a box to fit it to the shape, and then use box morphing. Another example of fitting of uh, of edges. In this case, the origin or the control entities actually is uh, a sequence of edges. This is fitted to a target. We have some rows of elements that are actually morphed and again, bordered to the rest of the model, our boundary. 
So and here you see a, a typical um, result of morphing when uh, the morphed area actually is quite small compared to the distance the morphing uh, is applied. So uh, usually um, by morphing we get quite well, stretched or squeezed elements that can hardly directly be used for, uh, for a simulation later on. So that's why you can always apply um, a reconstruction of the morphed area in order to smooth or to get a better mesh that can be used for the simulation later on. So the algorithm knows what actually is the area that is morphed that needs a reconstruction and it can be applied automatically on this area. Here an example on uh, fitting, again, an edge fitting um, of the geometry now, not an FE mesh, but the geometry. So uh, we have this time uh, multiple source and target lines. Of course, you can also use uh, the whole, let's say, U profile, one, two, three, as a single origin and target. But then it may happen that here, the corner of the green area does not exactly match the corner of the orange area. So that's why it's better to use separate um, origin target segments for each say, smooth line. So one for the left, one for the rear, and one for the right. The morphed area are the surrounding faces boundary again the rest to the undeformed model so how my mouse hangs all the time so here you see the morphine Of course, this can be applied also to uh, to solid meshes. If you imagine that this is uh, the surface of a CFD model, and here attached is the whole uh, fluid domain, you can not only uh, morph the surface of the of the model, but also accordingly the solid elements around them, the cells of the fluid domain. Here's a similar example to what we have seen before with uh, the box morphing. This can also be achieved by direct morphing, by sliding on uh, specific predefined curves. Without the need to create boxes. So, here an example of surface fitting. We have an initial surface, the yellow one here, with uh, some underlying parts that should be well, morphed with the yellow one. And we want to fit it uh, on a new target surface. Maybe the next version of the car is a little bit bigger, higher. And due to the lack of uh, existing 
cut files for the whole car. We just need the old, we just use the old one and fit it to the new shape. So the yellow area in this case is our control entities, our green entities that we want to fit onto the red area, the target surface. The underlying parts is what is morphed. In fact. Another example, a little bit more what to be morphed. Again, the yellow area here, the roof is the initial surface. Blue one is the target surface and the side panels, they should be morphed. So Um, another example is the morphing um, by using cross-section curves. If you don't have uh, uh, a target shape, maybe just some slices or you want to see in which area uh, you want to change the, uh, the cross-sections, you can use uh, cross-section curves on distinct cutting planes. Here we have the original uh, cross sections of this uh, A pillar and some target curves in the respective planes. And by fitting the original cross section curves onto the target curves, part is morphed. Well, actually, everything which is between. The, uh, these cross-section planes belongs to the morphed area. Um, there are some specific functions concerning morphing of holes, changing, for example, the diameter of 2D holes here. You cannot only uh, apply it on, let's say, the first row of elements, the washer, but arbitrary ones. The same um, possible for, we mean by call them 3D holes in older versions, they were called tubes. To separate them from the 2D holes in a shell mesh. So for the 3D holes, the same as possible. You can identify first the holes and then change their diameters. Another functionality is uh, the creation and the modification afterwards of uh, so called beads and embosses. Um, it belongs also to the, more, uh, to the morphing, um, not the creation itself, but um, we can move these features later on. So, uh, for example, here we created such a bead. Create circular flash openings or other shapes, and uh, you know, in the latest versions, we have uh, all these types of features as uh, separate entities that can be 
directly um, touched and uh, yeah, you can work with the features directly. So uh, we have features like beats, feature, feature, rip, and on all these features, we can apply so-called design changes And this is what we see here on this slide. We have a feature lead, we have a feature hole, and we can slide, move them on the underlying surface, copy them to specific locations, and the source as well as the target area um, are remeshed, reconstructed accordingly to good mesh around them. Another example of these design change procedures is uh, the change of the of a position of a part. So we can move one part on along another one and uh, adapt all the flanges, all the areas where these are in contact. So the side walls, this member. So we have here. one is moved, you see the flanges, they adapt to the target location of the underlying part. Now when we do morphing, um, the whole morphed area is uh, kind of squeezed or stretched. So um, if we have some specific features in the morphed area, like the round holes, for example, um, they will not stay round. You will see it here. Um, here it is, it's uh, more or less round. If we uh, do the morphing, we squeeze the area and this gets oval. Um, in order to avoid this, um, we can apply morphing constraints. There are different types of morphing constraints. Here we have uh, used nested elements. They look like, uh, like RBE elements the FE, and we can apply specific decrease of freedom for the morphing action on these um, on these nested elements. For example, we have here an area that where this nested element just moves as a rigid. So the location of the reference point is simply be morphed, but the nodes attached on this nested elements are not morphed by the morphing. They follow as a rigid the reference point. Another example here, here this nested element is not moved at all. So uh, we can even constrain all degrees of freedom for the morphing and keep a specific area, although it is included in the morphed area, as fixed. These nested elements can be applied on box morphing or on direct morphing. Here we have some other examples. Here, this bead or this uh, hole should not be morphed. Uh, as a shape, it 
itself, but its location should be follow the shape of the whole part. Or if you have such a cross member like we have seen in the in the in the roof example before, there are several holes. When we increase the width, the holes should stay, should keep their shape, but their position should change according to the size changed. There are other types of constraints. Um, in this example, we, we see a so-called path follower constraint. If we uh, want to move this, uh, well, here on my screen, it's green. This green area to the left or to the right, um, well, the nodes here, We we'll change this curvature here. We we'll see it here on the right side. If we just move the nodes to the left, we change the curvature here. So if we new use uh, this parse follower constraint, we say that these nodes they should not move to the left or to the right like the general morphing but they should morph along the path, along the existing edges. This can be done with such a path follow constraint. This is not applicable to box morphing. This kind of uh, morphing constraints works for direct morphing. Another constraint is the flange constraint. We increase the width of the orange part. Without any constraint, we get intersections here with the flange constraint. The nodes are lifted a bit in order to avoid intersections. All these morphing actions that we have seen, either box morphing or direct morphing, can be parameterized, which means I can not only use them interactively once, but I can apply parameters on them and by this use them later on in an optimization. So otherwise I would not have shown them to you here. Uh, these parameters, so-called morphing parameters, um, if you have a lot of them, it might be a little bit difficult uh, to judge how they change the model and uh, to see uh, effects of one parameter onto the other. So uh, there's a possibility to, uh, well, loop through the range of the parameters and uh, get a video in order to see how the model behaves when the values of the morph parameters are changed. can even uh, change the view during the video. So not always looking at the same location or from the same viewport. You see the model, the model change through the change of the parameters. I know that the mesh here is not what you are used to get from ANSA typically. So sometimes um, it may be necessary to decrease the number of morphing parameters 
in order not to have too many design variables when you do the optimization later on. Um, so uh, there's a possibility, maybe you want to use it once, to uh, kind of create a macro to record a macro to record uh, what happened through changing morphing parameters and then to interpolate between start and end point of this recording. So let's assume here we have an initial shape of the model and we have some uh, morphing actions that we apply here, for example, an edge fitting of the boxes and then we move some control points. So different morphing actions that lead to a target shape. And this was recorded. Uh, and then we can interpolate between the starting and the target, the end position with just one parameter, so-called deformation parameter. Something which has nothing to do with uh, direct morphing or or box morphing is uh, a specific parameter called tailored well blank. Um, it is for, well, optimizing uh, Taylor blanks. And uh, this is actually a way of optimizing the PID areas with different uh, thicknesses. So we can uh, move these um, pit boundaries through the model and have this as parameter for an optimization, for example. Well, when we have a, when we are finished with morphing, for example, the, um, the optimization has run and we get uh, an optimized shape here. Usually you want to um, transfer this back to, uh, um, to the cut model. So there's a possibility to map this, well, I will, I call it the deformation field through the morphing. So you can map this uh, deformation field onto another part here onto the original cut geometry. And you get the cut geometry in the same shape as the optimized FE model. The source for this deformation field can be quite different, can be a deformation parameter, can be some stored history states, design variables, or even a text file with coordinates and the vector when you want to apply it from an external application. All right, let's have a look on some uh, functionalities um, that assist us in uh, using the morphing functionalities. Um, the first one are auxiliary uh, topo entities like 3D points or curves. Even if our model is a pure of image, we can uh, create points or curves out of edges or feature lines in order to easier select source and targets for fittings, for example. Then very important, uh, the model browser or part manager in older versions, uh, especially if you do uh, morphing with 
boxes, the box in box morphing, um, you have somehow distinguish between the global and the local. Morph boxes do not have a property. They could also not be put in a set or a layer or whatever, um, but we can put them in different parts. So we use the model browser in order to organize our morph content. You can also uh, shade your model according to the part to see which areas belong to which morphing action. And also to select, you can easily select all the boxes of a part by, uh, by the feature selection tool. And we've already seen an example, reconstruct and smooth is uh, integrated in uh, our morphing actions, suitable for box and direct morphing, and it increases, improves the mesh after a morphing with quite large deformations has been applied. Now you see here, we have a lot of Call them off elements that violate some criteria after the morphing. So we can apply a reconstruct on this area to get better mesh, suitable mesh for the first simulation. If you want to see uh, the, the deformations through morphing, you can. Uh, uh, have a fringe plot of that. It works only on the uh, on FE model, so on meshes. It does not work on geometry, pure cut geometry. But on meshes, you can get a fringe of the deformation. And of course, you can use the measurement tool if, if you are interested in spa some specific. Uh, measurements like some uh, diameters or distances. And what's quite new um, is it called uh, is a, a function called the DFM migration. Uh, we have seen it for the for the boxes. You can. Uh, Use you reuse the boxes for different models. Uh, and the question was, how can we do this, this with direct morphing? So uh, for this, there exists the DFM migration tool. And this is exactly for applying DFM morphing parameters on different models. We have here, for example, uh, a very fine model on the left side where we apply some DFM morphing. And we want to uh, transfer this DFM morphing and apply it on a, another discipline model with the coarser mesh, for example. So we can just transfer these areas, origin area, control entities, the morph area, boundaries, to the other model, and easily apply the same morphing on the other model without the need to have to do the definition of this DFM parameter again. Okay. That's actually uh, all concerning morphing. We will have a few minutes left for Looking on uh, the ANSA parameters, it's basically uh, for all these card values of the different solvers. ANSA parameters um, can be uh, of different types. We can even use expressions in order to combine parameters. You assign such a parameter 
typically with pressing F3 in the field. Yeah, when you move your cursor over such a field, you get a tooltip. And there you can uh, you see that with F3, you can enter a parameter. And then by changing the parameter, the value of the card is changed as well. There's also the possibility to import and export from or to uh, keyword star parameter for the solver that have such a parameter. In this case, it's an uh, Abacus distributed load so that the parameter even appears as a parameter in, in the solver input file. Another example where such parameters are used is uh, the composite tool, the laminate tool. You can use parameters for varying um, the thickness or the nominal um, fiber angle. optimization with this and we have already seen you can use it in the connection manager in order to parameterize connection entities like connection lines the distance of spot welds the diameter of spot welds all the fields that exist there can be assigned to a parameter. Well, that's all for today. Thank you very much, Karistopoli. Hope uh, to see or to uh, that you have the opportunity to attend to the next week's session as well. There we will see um, how we set up an optimization for Alice Opt. How does it work with the optimization tool optimization task in ANSA and see how the workflow is for that. Thanks a lot. Have a nice remaining Friday and also a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk, for this nice talk. And I like, would like to ask everyone um, to also fill out our evaluation form because this helps us to improve the sessions. I'm going to post a link into the in the chat. So please fill out the evaluation form. Um, it's free. You don't have to register. Yeah, it's really easy. It's fast. And then with that being said, uh, thank you, Dirk, again. And then see you next time.